Jeremiah, we're going to get in, we're going to spend some time right now looking at beauty. And then we're going to segue into the beauty of servitude, the beauty of, we'll probably focus on number four, which is inner and outer beauty. The introduction is capacity. Uh, number one is enjoyment. Number two is that, that enjoyment and, and that capacity should have you on your knees. Uh, understanding that the truth is for you to get in line and that God loves holiness and so forth and and uh, you want to seek his mercy three is appointed time there's only a certain amount of time that God appoints for things to exist and to live uh, Adam and Eve did not exist until he brought them into existence is the point and of course there was a termination of that existence Four is inner and outer beauty, which I want to talk a, a little bit about right now. But before we do, let's go over our 17 points. 17, uh, we talked about here uh, yesterday or so. We talked about, this is 140-something here uh, in the playlist of beauty. And 17 is to sit by the throne. In other words, as they say nowadays in America, to chill and to hang out with the Lord. And that, that sounds awfully cool. And um, we talked about that uh in the previous videos. Uh, but let's go back to 1, 2, 3, 4, which is rather easy for you to remember that, that, that we're going to start going through these much quicker. And, uh, and, uh, and if you get lost, don't, uh, don't fret. Don't worry. Just relax. And just hang in there, some of you, okay, who are having a little bit of difficulty. We do go a little bit faster than some uh, Bible teachers, but uh, let's get going. This is Jeremiah with New Covenant. We're at 140-something here. I'll enumerate it later. And we're looking at the theme of beauty, but today we're going to talk about the basics of beauty, then we're going to branch into the beauty of servitude again. We talked about that earlier in Isaiah 42, 52. We're going to talk about uh, chapter 10 and 11 of Matthew, where we have our first real big introduction into the whole idea of soldierhood, discipline, and servitude. Up until now, we have not really gotten a lot of soldier dictation from the master. We've gotten a lot of personality characteristics. Uh, the kingdom means that you're forgiven and so forth. And we, 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 and the master has talked about how to pray. He's talked about a few personality issues, uh, uh, problems that humans have in doing things that the Lord doesn't like or he hates. Uh, then he started talking about how everything is encapsulated with what he's already mentioned, which is merciful. One of the five, ten cornerstones of Christianity is mercy. And he closes chapter five with that. Then he gets into how Christianity is basically for secret agents. That's number 32 uh, on this playlist and uh, on this channel. 32 is that you are a secret agent. In Matthew chapter 6, the master defines what a secret agent is. Pray in secret, fast in secret. Uh, even the Beatitudes are basically performed or love one-on-one -on -one relationship with people is done in secret. As opposed to the guys who are in charge, the Pharisees, they are big loudmouth type guys, so to speak. They, they, are, they are the, you know, the, the showboats. But they, but they don't really know God, they don't love God. But, but, but yet they have maybe a giant cross on or something that they have today, for example. And that's supposed to mean that they know God or something like that. They have the right hat on for the, for the, the Levite priest or something. And so, so that means that they know God. And, but God, Jesus is saying that he's not going to bother them, essentially. He does go into the temple and turn the tables over because they're, they're basically there for money. But the point is, is that he's contrasting their behavior at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 with a real Christian to the fake people. In other words, Christianity is going to be a secret agent event. Pray in secret, fast in secret. And the people who are listening, uh, who are the leaders, they're upset automatically because they know that he's talking about them because they can identify the fact that they are showboats and, and, that, they, and that they blast their, 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 what they do to, to the public. I prayed, I gave money. And not much different than what we have today on television and so forth. Overdressed, uh, proud, I did this kind of people, God owes me something or something like that. But what we're, what we're going to get into right now is we're going to go over beauty 
and we're going to talk about inner and outer beauty a lot here. And we're going to talk about how soldierhood is being introduced in chapter 10 and 11 of the chron chronological presentation of your gospel. Now, we're, we're looking at Matthew uh, chapter 1 and moving through talking about the, 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 the chronology, okay? Because the other gospels introduce different things at different times, or the harmony of the gospels and so forth. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four. We're going to take it from just simply how Matthew 1 develops, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then we go to Luke and Mark and then John and the book of Acts, okay? That's how we're kind of going to, that's how we're going to do this. Now, we will bounce around, but we're really going to start hammering home the first 10 chapters of Matthew a lot, which I've done a little already. And then we're going to move on, okay? Now, and we're kind of doing that right now, of course, because we're going to chapter 10 and 11, okay? We're going to talk about two components, and it's going to get a little deep, but you pay attention because we're going to bounce around a little bit, okay? We've already talked about beauty, which is classific classification number seven. Of course, we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, the only name given. And that, of course, is 52 on my list, by the way. Uh, uh, category 52. Now, we just mentioned, uh, we, we just mentioned uh, uh, 32, which is you're a secret agent basically as a Christian. You're under the radar of television, popularity, and yet you are the one that's going to shine on the Lord's Day. And the people who are shining like the Pharisees, bragging and boasting, they're the ones who are going to be reduced and you're going to be elevated. Now, that's very simple uh, gospel sound doctrine, okay? Now, beauty, we're going to focus on four. We're going to go through all 17 to, so that you can get warmed up for all 17 of these, especially one through seven. You, you, we should start hammering that home, okay? We're, we're adding more to seven, but it's really, really right now we're responsible for one through seven, okay? And the introduction, which makes eight. Now, we're going to look at 10 and 11, and I'm going to point out the beauty of servitude today. We're going to talk about how we already talked about how the word servant, the, the father and, of course, the son too, they reference servitude to delight. I told you the word delight is ginormous in your Bible. The word delight, it means happy, but it also means that we're happy about something that's good. We're happy about something that's happened that didn't have to happen. And that goes to volition and will, which is six on this list. In other words, the, the, the father is happy with the son because the son didn't have to submit to the father. That's the point. He had his own will, his own volition. But since the son decided to, in a human body, he decided to select pleasing father and servitude, now the father has delight. And now we're going to transfer that transaction to us and to you so that you are going to become a servant and now father is going to be delighted in you see that's that that's the point because until now we have not gotten into what you might call living bread in terms of chronologically matthews one through nine you you really haven't hammered home in one through nine complete servitude yet it really hasn't happened. All we have is underpinnings. All we have is a, a subtext or a paratext. We really haven't gotten to the big issues. When chapter 10 and 11 come, guess what happens? The, the home run hitters show up. In chapter 10 and 11, all of a sudden we find out what's the bottom line in Christianity. Because until then, the masters talked about Who's going to be blessed based upon these behaviors? Then he talks about things he doesn't like, that he even hates. And disqualification behaviors. Because the first part of chapter 5 is the good behaviors. The second part of chapter 5 is bad behaviors. Such as adultery and hating people. Then he closes the chapter with with good stuff, which is you are going to be merciful at the end of the chapter, which he's already mentioned mercy at the beginning of the chapter, but he closes the chapter with the big enchilada, which is how important and critical being caring and forgiving is. 
Then he, we move to chapter 6, and all of a sudden, we're going to secret agent stuff. Okay? All of a sudden, we're secret agents. We were secret agents at the beginning because when you do things that are compliant to the Beatitudes, that's one-on-one -on -one behavior. So one-on-one -on -one behavior all of a sudden comes back again at the beginning of chapter 6. You got that? Pardon me. Fast in secret. Pray in secret. Do this in secret. Do that in secret. Well, there you go. You're a secret agent. Getting recognition from people can be extremely dangerous for the Christian convert. But let's move on. Having said that, now we're going to get into not what God loves out of people as far as their behavior goes, not as far as you're going to have to suffer, which is the, which is the early part of Matthew chapter 5, and it's ordained for you to suffer, and like the prophets, then he talks about the law, that he didn't come to destroy the law, and, the, and then he says there are two different kinds of Christians. There are some who are just going to barely get in the door, and there are those who are going to hammer home salvation. Then he goes into things he hates. Then he goes into how you better be merciful and caring and forgiving, and he closes the chapter out. Then in 6, all of a sudden, guess what happens? We're back. We're, we're, we're at secret agent stuff. Then the secret agent is once again compared to the, the, the loudmouth types, if I can use that word. I don't want to use that word, but to, to save time, that's what they are. And he's saying, but that's not the way it's going to be with you. See, he's going to say, but, but you, but you, but you, meaning on the contrary, this is going to be you. He doesn't, he doesn't lose that theme throughout the entire chapter, chapter 6. Contrast, more contrast. Now, before we get into something else too deep here, I want to say that, that in chapter 6, there are no basic commands at this point yet. There, in other words, there's the overarching command has not been introduced yet. That's the point. Now, repentance and baptism has been introduced. Those are two cornerstone commands. Got that? But up until chapter 10, you really haven't gotten any cornerstone commands yet. You haven't got any major overarching commands. You get subtext, pray in secret. Subtext, no adultery. Subtext, don't hate. Subtext, uh, uh, fast in secret. Subtext, uh, don't store up money. Okay? Subtext, don't worry about tomorrow. Subtext, the, 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 the animals and, and, or the, the, the trees are ta well taken care of. You're much more valuable than trees. So don't worry about tomorrow and be righteous today and tomorrow will be taken care of you. Back to that a sophism, where you just are going to really seek the Lord and everything's going to be added unto you, and then the chapter's over. And there's more contrast to talk about. We're going to let that go in chapter 6. Now, in 7, do you see any commandments pretty much at all? No, just to trust in the Lord and to be confident in the words of Jesus Christ and his powers. That's all we get in 7 and 8. Uh, we got losers who, who, who sink in quicksand, who, who don't stick to the narrow road, and uh, Father wants to take care of you. He, he Once again, chapter 7, which was mentioned in chapter 6, that Father's going to take care of you because he takes care of humans in general. And for those of you who are children, who are obviously behaving well, and you belong to the fold of Jesus Christ, etc., God's not going to give you a serpent if you ask for a fish. And all this wonderful discourse about how you are really in like Flint when you become a Christian, in general. Okay? And there's no contradiction in the fact that, it, it, uh, that the first thing he said was, you're going to face horrific uh, persecution. Then in chapter 6 he says that you're going to face, I mean chapter 7, 
that God's going to take good care of you. However, there is no contradiction there. Uh, in general, God's going to take care of most Christian people, and he cares for them more than he cares for the, the grass, and he takes care of grass. However, he did mention that Christian people are going to go through some very difficult times, and it can be very, very severe. That's the first thing he taught about. That's the first thing he said. So Christianity is what? It's a mixed bag. For fourth to eighth graders paying attention to these first chapters, Christianity is a mixed bag in general. And we can't define how much you're going to go through uh, God taking care of you, which is part of chapter 7, or how much of chapter 5 where you're going to face horrible persecution just like Jeremiah or whoever. See? See, so we go back and forth here, and guess what? It's all good, as they say. I'm giving you some sound general doctrine right now because I'm going to start going through the Bible with you and we're starting on chapter 5 but basically we're going to lean towards what? Beauty right now, okay? We're leaning towards beauty and we're going to talk about some of the first major scriptures of your Bible chronologically in the New Testament. Okay, that's what we're going to do right now. He talks about false prophets who's in chapter 7, of course, we're not going to get into that right now and a few other items. We're not going to get into everything. There's a famous politician on TV the other day who said that he called one of the pastors in his city uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing and a false pastor. Right in his face, he called him a false, a false teacher. In other words, he said that the, the criteria for a false teacher was applicable to this gentleman who has a church. There are a lot of false leaders and so forth. Matt, the master goes into that and so forth. We're not going to go into that today. Eight, we have healing, and all of a sudden we're going to focus on God's power right now. When you go into chapter 8 of Matthew, we're talking about having confidence in God's powers and how, how significant that is. However, some people park on this part of the Bible, and that's called eh, wrong answer because confidence needs love. Otherwise, it won't last. It won't work. It's not saving confidence. Now, let's skip that part. Uh, of course, the Master talks about, uh, in chapter 9, 8, 9, he talks about how he has power to do what? To heal anybody and to forgive people's errors and sins. He has that power and authority. The exousia in the Greek. He has that legal authority to do that. And he says, who, who, he said, which one is more difficult? And, and what he's saying is, is that nobody can do either one of them. I can't walk up to somebody and go, you're forgiven for your sins. I can't walk up to somebody and say, you're, 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 you're just about ready to die. Why don't you go play basketball? I can't, I can't do that, but God can. Now let's move on to 10, where we get into the real nitty-gritty, uh, because he's talking about the anointing in the middle of chapter 9. There, or the, in the middle of chapter 9, he talks about the anointing. Getting the, getting the river of life, and, and we call that, uh, um, on, our, on, our, on our playlist here, we have a category that I just inserted that we're going to talk about, but let's let that go for now, because we're getting into too much stuff. But that, that's more along the lines of the river of life, okay, for, coming from Father. And that comes into you, it's a river of love, and that is coming to Christian people. And at the end, the middle of chapter 9, the Master is saying he's not going to give his river of love to people who don't get their act together and get prepared. Or who receive it and resist it. And don't handle it properly. His power, his love. His, 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 his power is love. It's, a, it's love electricity. And if you don't handle it right, then, then, then you're not going to be a vessel to take it in. I, I have a Greek word for that. Let's let that go. So, so here we have headed on to chapter 10. We're, we're going to let storing the, the Holy Spirit and working with the Holy Spirit alone for now. That's the middle of nine. We're going to jump to ten, which gets into what the disciples or anyone has as far as evangelism and even teaching, okay? This is your first big whammo for evangelism. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you meet people? Uh, shake the dust off your feet. Uh, don't worry about people hurting you, which he's already mentioned in chapter five. 
because the hairs of your head are numbered. He has every hair. He has everything in his brain. Uh, how to fix your whole body and take care of you. So don't you fret about running into people, persecuting you, locking you up, or whatever kind of things that are going to happen to these gentlemen. Now, let's move to the end of the chapter where we get to the real nitty-gritty here. This is where we get into what the Master calls, what, we, what, what, what the Master is essentially calling commandments and living bread. This is where we get to category 11, which is also part of category 2, which is sound doctrine. They're, they're both tied in together. However, 11 takes out of sound doctrine or Christian principles living bread by itself, which is extremely important because this is the part of sound doctrine that is required of you, and it's the overarching idea. It, 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 it's the time in a Christian's life, whether they're, whether they're, whether they've walked in the door or they've been there for a while for them to encounter the 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 big stuff okay and and and, and we call it living bread here because up until now we, we we really haven't hammered home salvation in a in a in a, in a monstrous way chronologically in matthew 1 through 10. as a matter of fact through your entire bible you haven't hammered home salvation like you do in chapter 10. Chapter 10 hammers home salvation like nobody's business because it, it takes you to the top of the mountain. Up until now, we've talked about having confidence in the Lord. We've talked about healings. We've talked about provisions. We've talked about getting confused and liars and, and false representatives, heresies maybe. We've talked about... Uh, uh, God's care for you as a human. We talked about how to pray. We talked about He's now your Father, and and so once you've repented and you're baptized, you now can call Father Father and 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 seek to do His will and learn some of the things that God hates in chapter five, such as hating people and so forth, and some of the things He obviously likes or loves, which is for you to behave well and so on. So my point is is that now we've gotten into the, what is the bottom line of this entire Bible? And let's get to it. Now, we're talking about number four here. Inner and outer beauty and the beauty of servitude. Because we're piggybacking on Isaiah 42, 52, which talks about servant and how God is delighted in his servant. Behold my servant. Meaning that person has gotten to the place where they put on a servant mind. Therefore, God is going to find delight in them. That's the number one issue here. Numero uno. And I spend a lot of time talking about number one here a lot. And I think we're doing a nice job here of tying beauty into this too. Because, see, see what's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to Father. You thought he was like you, the he might love inner beauty, and you might love only outer beauty. See the point? We're adjusting our mind according to Big Father, right on top of your head. And that's why we're getting to number four right now. We, we, we've been waiting to get to this. Now we're going to hammer this home. That inner beauty is humility and kindness according to Father's eyes. Most of my life, I was trained to enjoy beauty that's outer. That's not 100% bad. God wants you to enjoy outer beauty. However, you're going to have to add inner beauty into the mix. Your cognitive stock is going to have to insert the value of character and inner beauty. You're going to have to do that. That's putting on the mind of Christ, and we're going to do that right now, talking about how inner beauty is the big deal, which goes back to number two in beauty, which is what? Outer beauty should reveal inner beauty. When you see the world and how beautiful it is, it should tell you that somebody who is very caring and very intelligent created what you're looking at. Also, that what you're looking at reveals that whoever made it they really love order. I just watched a war movie last night. When you, go, when you join the army, you have to get an order. 
Otherwise, you don't belong to the team. They will discharge you. Same thing is when, you, when you're born, you should realize that you're a soldier and that you're just part of the team here. And that you are going to have to respond to whatever the creator who, who demands order, what order does he want out of me? That's the key issue here. What do you want from me, Mr. Order? You created me, so I want to get in order. I, I want to live forever uh, by listening to what you have to say in order for me to get in order because me and my grandparents sinned against you and, and we want to change our status. And when we come to Jesus Christ, we learn how to change that status. I'm going to give you some, some of the big enchilada stuff here. We're, we're talking big stuff here now. When you get to 10 and 11, you're getting to the overarching principles of everything you've already read up to chapter 10, big time. Once again, the key issue uh, that we've gone through chapter 1 and one through 10, and of course through your whole Bible, of course, is sound doctrine, which is the first principles of sound doctrine, are the Lord's going to draw you to his son, and you're going to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to the Son, and you're going to enter into Him being Master and Lord, and you being servant, and, and you're going to learn about that relationship. That's, that's where sound doctrine begins, and it starts with repentance and baptism. You got that? That's number two. Now, sound doctrine it ties in with number 11, which is living bread. In other words, living bread has in it repentance and baptism. But here's what the master is doing. He's taking you from chapter 4 to repentance and baptism, which is the cornerstone of Christianity. Then, then when chapter 10 comes at the end of the chapter, he's taking you to another big heavy hitter. In terms of what? Commandments. Got that? So you're obeying number 3 in my list, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's the top command. You're obeying that command by doing what we're talking about. That's the point. It's called fulfilling the royal law. That means that you're living what you're supposed to live. Okay? That's what, that's what this is about. And now, now we, we've already touched on the main two components, which start out sound doctrine, which is number two in my, on, on our Bible list here. Don't get confused now. Number two is repentance and baptism. When we get to number 11, it's basically the same thing. Because now we're getting into living bread and the first basic top drawer stuff. Okay? It's just that simple. This is top drawer. Okay? Let's see how much time we have. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to come back to this and we're going to get to top drawer. And we're going to, we're going to tie this into beauty because servitude is what Father is happy with. And it's obviously something beautiful for him to see. Isn't it nice when you see relatives behaving well at a, at a picnic or something? It, it, that becomes a beautiful situation, as opposed to being ugly when somebody wants to behave improperly and be rude and to be harmful or malicious. That's, that's called ugly. Okay? Some of you may be wondering, how does beauty tie into all this? I'm telling you right now, beauty it ties into everything. Because good behavior is beautiful. And bad behavior is ugly. Now, it's, it's a broad concept that we're going to get into it. I'll be right back. We're, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about beauty and, and enumerate those uh, 1 through 7. And we're, we're going to get into through 17. And then we're going to jump to chapter 10. And we're going to talk about how love, number 1, is the same thing as servitude. We're going to talk about that. Because that's what, I'm, that's what I'm driving towards here, is that love is work. I talk about my parents a lot here because they didn't talk about loving me very much. They just did it. Talk is cheap. It's like, woo, 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 I'm going to do this. and uh, uh, you know, We're going to do that. And they, well, are you going to do it? My brother David, he, he calls it chin music. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Well, yeah, I care about Cindy. Whatever. Okay, okay, dude, dude. Okay, why don't you just do it and kind of be quiet about it? We, we don't mind you talking about it. That's fine. But we're getting a lot of lip service around here. That's the point. 
I'll be right back with some of the big issues pertaining to Christianity and sound doctrine. We're going to tie in number two and number 11 and even three, one and three, and it, it, all this ties in together. I'm going to show, show you how Bible principles tie together. It's not that difficult. Okay? I want to talk about power in this too because this, this can get pretty deep. I want to talk about power too. As John says, to, him, to them he gave power because power is a big part of this. But we'll stop right there. Maranatha. 